listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live uncommon. So you might have noticed a few things have changed around here at KFUO. In <laughs> Sounds the so ominous. Past. <laughs> nothing bad, nothing bad. We have a, a new host on Thy Strong Word, yes. and we haven't had the time to like sit down and chat and really get to know behind the scenes who is Dr. Phil Boo. Yes. So that's what we're going to do today. Our guest is the Reverend Dr. Phil Boo. He's host of Thy Strong Word here on KFUO. Pastor Boo, thanks so much for joining us on The Coffee Hour. Well, thank you guys. I'm happy to be on here. Well, we are just delighted to have you on the team as host of Thy Strong Word. When Pastor Finnern was elected as district president and made us aware that he would no longer be able to host (laughs) every day or every weekday on KFUO due to his new duties as district president in Minnesota North District, we said we need to find a new host. And we knew that Pastor Boo had been on regularly as a guest. and, Mm -hmm. And so... That's why we said, let's check with Pastor Boo and see if this works for for him. And uh, we're so glad that it did, that uh, your family and your congregation were all willing to to, to allow you, <laughs> to, share the, you yeah, to share you with us. <laughs> I have just been enjoying listening to Thy Strong Word when you're hosting and learning when you share little bits of little stories here and there, learning a little bit about Pastor Phil Boo. One of the interesting things that I've learned is um, that you became Lutheran later in life. So I want to know more about this story about becoming Lutheran. What was your confession of faith before being Lutheran? Well, okay, sure. Yeah, that's a very, it's a very dear experience to my heart because, huh. you know, it, it, who I am today as a, both a pastor and as a Christian is due to the variety of experiences that I had growing up. So just to kind of cut to the chase, I grew up down south, as you will hear me say occasionally on the show, and in the environment of the Bible Belt, it's often said that it doesn't matter where you go, but that you go. The importance is that you are a Christian and that you go to church somewhere. At least that's how it was when I was growing up. And so due to that, I don't remember a time ever not being at least someone who goes to church. I didn't really grow up in a family that belonged to churches. We would kind of move from church to church, but I distinctly remember growing up and my my dad's cousin is a pastor of the Church of Christ. Now, that's not the United Church of Christ. It's a, a different kind. It's it's a what they call a repristinationist church body. And the Church of Christ is a very strict church, and I remember going there as a kid. And then I remember going to the Methodist church for a little while, and we'd go to the Baptist church. And so after a while, it was just my dad and I for the most part, and we would go to a church. It was just me and him. We were living in a one-bedroom apartment. I was going to school, uh, middle school, going into high school. You know, he was working to kind of provide for us. And I'm not joking when I say we kind of went to church based on what they served after the meal. And we found out that the Methodists like to serve little cakes and cookies, and the Baptists, though— would serve like full meals, fried chicken and, and, you know, potatoes and green beans. So anyway, I became a Baptist and (laughs) in the Baptist tradition that you, you express your faith by giving your heart to Jesus. And so you don't get baptized until you're able to confess that faith. So for them, baptism is a, a public confession of the faith that you've decided to follow Christ. So around 13, 14 years old, I did just that at Cornerstone Baptist Church and the right Reverend Ricky Rogers, who was the pastor there. I was baptized in the baptismal font, four deacons on each side to make sure every part of me went under. And I became a Christian in the eyes of this Southern Baptist Convention. Interestingly enough, though, because I'd been raised around the word, there was never a time, even as a child, when I didn't believe. So my faith continued to be built up by attending worship, both at this Baptist church. When I was about 14 years old, maybe a year after I was baptized, I was very zealous for the Lord. And I said, I want to go to Haiti as a missionary. And my dad says, well, I can't let you go to Haiti on your own. So we, he goes with me and we went down to Haiti. We joined up with Pentecostal ladies and I have all kinds of stories about that, but your show is not that long. And I headed down to Haiti for the first time, and it also changed my perspective on what it means to be a Christian, what it means to live out your faith and share the word with others. 
my dad would go on to Haiti a lot after that, and I would revisit it later on as a pastor. But back to the idea here, I then went off to college, and as many college students experience, I wasn't in the faith very much. I, I still believed, but I didn't go to church. I didn't avail myself to God's word. And then I got married to my high school sweetheart, Becky. We were living then post-college. We were living in an apartment. I was a private investigator doing insurance fraud investigations over three states. And we knew we, that we needed to be back in church, though. She was raised Pentecostal, me Baptist, but we knew we wanted to be back in the faith. And so to make a very long story short, one day someone just knocked on our door, invited us back to church. And so we, we went, but it was at the local Baptist church, and they had canceled worship that day because they had some sort of Awana event. And so we left there not knowing anybody, and we just traveled around looking for a church to go to. And the only one we could really find was the local Lutheran church. And we didn't go there because we were pretty sure they were Catholic. So the next Sunday, after doing some research on the internet, we did go to that Lutheran church, and it was wonderful. I mean, and I am not exaggerating when I say, really for the first time in, well, my whole Christian experience, did I hear the gospel proclaimed so clearly. You know, you can hear a lot of how to live and how to please God, and certainly that Jesus died for you, but then there's always this, so you must, or, you know, you, you were saved by faith, so all you have to do is believe. And then for the first time in the liturgy, I, I hear the words of God being spoken to me, and I respond with the word of God. I hear the clear gospel proclaimed, and yeah, and we were hooked. And then within uh, six months, I was chairman of the Board of Divine Service. My wife was head of Altar Guild. And then a year later, I was teaching a second adult Bible study class. So, you know, fresh meat in a Lutheran congregation doesn't, doesn't get to sit around doing nothing for long. Now, is that, is that, that's the story you're talking about, maybe. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> a good one. It Man, is. Man, there are so many tangents in there. I wish we had about three hours. Well, I have unfortunately sure. been on those <laughs> tangents. Yeah. But I will say... After going to seminary, I, you know, I felt a little behind because I was with so many brothers who were lifelong Lutherans and some of their past, their dads were pastors and their granddads were pastors. And I went up to the, one of the professors and I don't actually remember his name. And I said, professor, I, I just feel like I'm so behind. And he told me something that also changed the way I thought about my ministry. And that is with my experience, I'm going to be able to connect with Lutherans who have, or sorry, with Christians who have been in all these other different experiences in ways that maybe a lifelong Lutheran would have a little bit more difficulty. And, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I think the Lord used that. You know, my first call was in Minnesota, but my second call was in Connecticut. And in Connecticut, mm -hmm. there were no lifelong Lutherans. And so a lot of the conversation was around, you know, why, why the Lutheran confessions? And the answer is always because it's such a clear exposition of the, of the Bible, of the gospel. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting perspective as a lifelong Lutheran. Sometimes I get a smidgen jealous of the people who have converted in in adulthood because you do have such, such a different perspective on the confessions and, and all of the the treasures that we have in our in our Lutheran faith. So that's that's a really cool story. I am curious now now that I've heard your story, I know a little bit better. But how did you actually end up at seminary? <laughs> okay, so that's an interesting story too. So <laughs> I was teaching the second adult Bible study. And I went to the pastor and I said, you know, I kind of like this. You know, when I went to undergrad, initially I was going to be, I wanted to be a band director. And then after taking a music appreciation and realizing I didn't really know anything about music and had no hope of learning anything, I said, maybe it's the teaching part that I like. So then I said, I'm going to pursue teaching. So I graduated with an applied criminology degree, which has nothing to do with teaching. And I was telling the, and I was do, I was a private investigator in the back of the van. And this does answer your question, I promise. And I'm, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm studying for the, the ELCEs or the entrance exams for the seminary because I had gone to the pastor and I said, I have a heart for teaching. I have a heart for helping people. That's kind of why I was interested in law enforcement in the first place. And he said, oh yeah, no, I saw this coming. And he yeah, he put me into the into the program. I went and interviewed with the district president and got approved. I told my wife, I said, this is what I think I'd like to do. She agreed. We sold just about everything we owned and then headed to St. Louis to an apartment that we had rented sight unseen. And that's sort of how it started. Yeah. Wow. What a story. <laughs> 
So since we're talking about education and, <clears throat> excuse me, in the seminary as well, there is a doctor in your title. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what did you study and, and why? So in my first call, I said, you know, I think I either want to join the military as a chaplain or get a demon. And one required more exercise than the other. So I decided to apply to Bethel University, which is in St. Paul, Minnesota. It is a, is a church run university. They have a great private school and seminary. It's operated by what used to be called the General Baptist Conference, but I think it's called Converge Worldwide or something like that now. And the track that I went into was congregational care and counseling. It was an emphasis on taking care of people, counseling people, use you know effective methods through their real issues. Because one of the things that they do a good job at our seminary with is introducing pastors to the concepts of you know, soul care, but also mind and body care. But the problem is it's just not enough time in our formation to really dig into those things deeply. And I had found myself involved with that a lot in the parish. So I went and I did this track. But then toward the end, when it came time for my dissertation and project, my emphasis had shifted just a little bit to catechesis. So my dissertation is called Cooperative Catechesis, Equipping parents and pastors to raise children in the faith. And that's a mouthful, but the, the short of it is this. It's nothing new. It's just returning to the word, returning to the confessions, and returning to what we all know, and that is that parents are the primary teachers of their children. And the church is here to obey the fourth commandment by helping them do that. But the question on the table is, how do we equip parents to do that? You know, I Early on in my ministry, I thought, oh, parents are just lazy and they don't want to teach their kids. And then I became a parent and realized, wow, no, it's that we just don't know how. And instead of just taking that from them, saying, okay, we'll just send them to send them to confirmation class and we'll take care of it. We really should be more interactive with parents, equipping them. And that's uh, what I've been trying to do ever since to varying degrees of success. <laughs> We're here meeting the Reverend Dr. Phil Boo, host of Thy Strong Word today, hearing his story, a little bit of behind the scenes <laughs> and uh, who he is. And it's a, it's a great story. We have more to share in just a little bit. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Today, we are sharing with you the story behind the scenes of the <laughs> Reverend Dr. Phil Boo, host of Thy Strong Word here on KFUO. And I realized there's one phrase that we should clarify when you said you were <laughs> going, when we were talking about getting your doctorate, and you said you were going to what, get something or get a, a demon. And we need to clarify <laughs> that you are not going to get a demon, but a demon. <laughs> Men. That's right. It's Correct. a doctorate, doctor of ministry degree, which is, you know, it's a little more practical of a degree than, say, a doctorate of philosophy or a PhD. Both are very effective and useful in the church. Demons are typically sought after by guys who, you know, want to stay in the parish and keep doing great things on the front lines, but would like to be, you know, better equipped to help minister to their congregation. So, yeah, D dot M I N dot. It's unfortunate that we've abbreviated it in that yeah, way. Yeah, right? you say it too fast and it gets real dicey. <laughs> Our pastor has a demon. <laughs> wow. Yikes. Anyway, moving on. Do you, I'm, I'm curious if you have any radio experience or was it, is this kind of your, your first foray into hosting and, and being a part of a radio show like this? So in 1991, when I was around 11, 10, 11 years old, my parents got me one of those little megaphones with buttons on the back that you could press like a three-digit code and it would play. Yes. Some. So I had one of those yes, too. Yes, I love that. So I would open the window 
of the little trailer house that we lived and I would host my own radio show for the whole mountain, anybody that could hear. And I would play the same six songs. It was more like a DJ experience, but then I would have commentary in between. And so I'm not sure anybody ever heard that, but that would have been my first foray into radio. Uh, we have similar stories. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then, and then next I, I did get interested in things like uh, I was always into CBs and stuff about 10 years too late. And then as a pastor, a brother in ministry got me interested in ham radio, which I would think I was about 40 years too late for that. But I am a, I do have a general license in ham radio. So I don't know if that counts, but I just loved talking with people. I love being behind the microphone. I really enjoyed it. So when I was in Connecticut, just sort of fast forwarding a lot, I had the opportunity to be on the radio a little bit through recording devotions for a local Christian radio station. Fellow pastor got me involved with that. That was exciting. You go down to the radio station and you record into the can and they put them out there. It was just, it was a fun experience. Of course, they still, I think, used reel to reel and they had like one of those AP machines that would, you know, type out the news. So it was a pretty old radio station, but it was exciting to see that. And so then when I had the opportunity to be on KFUO in various capacities, I think the very first time was doing one of the little sermonettes. Um, I jumped at the chance, uh, nervous, but I enjoyed it. And then with good friends like Pastor Tim Apple and uh, President Brady Finnern uh, and Sean, Pastor Sean Smith, who had been doing a, a show on KFUO, I just felt at home with these guys being on their programs and very much enjoyed it. So I was very happy when you guys reached out. Well, we're glad that that you said yes, and uh, <laughs> certainly glad to have you on board. Speaking of hosting Thy Strong Word, you've been doing that for a few months now. Let's see, how long has it been? What was that, June, July? I don't remember the beginning now. I can't either. August It 1st. was this summer. August oh, 1st. There you okay. Go. <laughs> August 1st. <laughs> so months. since since August 1st, what have you enjoyed? Wow, has it only been since it's August 1st? Since yeah, August that's August 1st. I was talking that. Uh, <laughs> what have you enjoyed most about hosting Thy Strong Word? The really great thing is the ability to connect with pastors whom I would have never really connected with. I mean, I, I'm friends with like 1,200 pastors on Facebook, but that's not really connecting with them. So being able to study the word uh, yeah, in a public forum, but just to connect with all the amazing talent that is out there in your congregations. And so for those listeners who are thinking about, you know, what's, what's the benefit in thy strong word for the pastor who's the guest? And I don't, I don't know, you know, they're, they're really, they're really putting in the effort and it's for you. They're not trying to get a name for themselves. They desperately love the word. They want you to be connected to it. And so a joy for me is being able to show listeners and parishioners just how uh, blessed they are to have their pastors. I, I want these pastors to shine in the eyes of their parishioners because the LCMS and one of the things that truly drew me to this, you know, denomination, so to speak, was how well prepared our pastors are for serving their people. And so hopefully through the show, I continue to be able to show that, but that's what I've enjoyed, both learning and sharing with the different pastors around the Senate. Okay, so on the flip side of that, what's been most challenging? I think the most challenging thing is that we are not face-to-face, -face, right? So over the radio and not even in studio has the added difficulty of making it a little difficult to know when to chime in, to know when someone's <laughs> you know, done talking, to see their face, you know, because when you're talking to someone face to face, you can kind of see them grimace if you say something they don't like and you can expand on that. So it's a little difficult doing it at such a distance. I think the other difficulty, too, has been that I enjoy going live, but some of the episodes are recorded. And I don't think that's a secret. And the, the recordings are a little more challenging to fit into the schedule. So, you know, it's a balance. Sometimes I'll be talking live about chapter 11 and then that evening recording one that's going to be chapter 16 and the next day be live with chapter 13. So it's, it's, it's not very linear. So there's a lot of little bitty things that add up. But, you know, these are things that are easy to overcome as you get more experience. How has uh, hosting a daily Bible study been beneficial to you or to your congregation? One thing that people don't always consider is that pastors are always in the Bible for other people. And while I suppose the radio station and the radio program, Thy Strong Word, can count for that, it also has given me a very structured way of being in the Bible 
uh, for myself. You know, I enjoy hearing what other pastors have to bring to the table. Frequently, I'm writing down, oh, that's a great idea. And because in theology, you know, nothing's really new under the sun, all we are doing is finding out new ways to communicate eternal truths. And so, yeah, I've grown in that ability. And even in my own Bible study at, at our, my congregation, I have a couple Bible studies, I, I'll happily go, oh, yeah, we were just talking about this on the radio. And, and, and people really do enjoy it. And I seem to have a decent little following here at the church, which is nice because people have an additional opportunity to be in the Word, and that's what every pastor wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now that you're a couple of months in, what are you looking forward to now that you kind of got your, got now that you're a, a bit on the roll and it's not so new anymore? What are you looking forward to in the, in the coming months and, and coming coming chapters that you're going to be, coming books of the Bible that you're going to be studying? Right. Well, in a general sense, I'm really looking forward to finding more of my voice for the program, you know, having the program be a little distinct and helping people connect better to the scriptures. In terms of uh, topics coming up, we're getting ready to go into Daniel, which is exciting, and James. And then the next really long one is going to be Exodus. And so Exodus is going to be a deeper study than, than has been done in a little while. I know Exodus has been done many years ago, but that's another thing too. It's always great to see these things applied to current contexts because the way that things are going in the world, we're always needing to take the eternal truths and apply them to our new situations. Mm. All right. As new talent on yes. KFUO, one of our favorite initiations <laughs> is in this in interview is the lightning round. It's the best. Are you ready? Right, here we go. We're talking favorites. Favorite <laughs> cuisine. I would have to say Japanese, specifically sushi, by a mile. Ooh. Yeah. You're Andy's favorite now. <laughs> <laughs> Love sushi. Sashimi, sushi, mm. all of it. I'm hungry now. I'll, I'll even eat okay. gas station sushi as long as it's sushi. Ooh. <laughs> that, that is that's, brave. That's brave. <laughs> <laughs> favorite book uh, other than the Bible. Fiction, I would have to say Stephen King's The Stand. But it's been ages since I've read it. Nonfiction, you know, I, I think most recently You Are What You Love, Spiritual Habit by James K.A. Smith. It's a great, great philosophical book. Interesting. All right. Favorite movie. I like bad movies. My favorite bad movie <laughs> is Escape from Miami or Space Mutiny. Uh. These are both late 80s films. They're just terrible. <laughs> They're awful. But what yeah, makes okay. them better is I, I love them being I'm riffed. So if, you, if you've ever been a like an, a Rift Tracks fan or MST3K, Mystery Science back in the day, I, I was you know raised on that. <laughs> So if a movie's too good, it's, it's, I don't know. It's just too good. I like the old, the bad ones. Yeah. That's hilarious. All right. Favorite ice cream, or if you don't like ice cream, favorite dessert. This is hard because uh, I, <laughs> I'm not a huge ice cream guy, but then, so I think, well, what dessert? Oh, I know. A uh, key lime pie, key lime pie. That's my oh. favorite. Yep. Easy. Okay. I can't believe I forgot. Well, it. I just get, haven't had it in forever. <laughs> Got to go to Florida to get that. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Vacation destination. So I grew up in the mountains, so I like the ocean. and But more than that, I like anywhere historic. I, I grew up going to – my dad would take me to Emerald Isle near Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. We'd go to Fort Macon and see the forts there and the the home of Wright Brothers, you know, where they, they – they, had the first flight, first in flight, North Carolina. So any anything that combines sort of the ocean and something historic, that's that's me. Yeah. Wow, we need to do like a KFUO history tour. Yeah, in the KO, KFUO fun. mobile. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Okay, my favorite one, favorite office supply. That one is really tough. My favorite office supply, I would have to say that it would be – I don't know if this is an office supply, but I this thing, I have this little coffee warmer right on my desk, oh. and it it's like one of these old school ones from the 80s that's probably mm -hmm. not authorized to be sold in the U.S., but mm -hmm. you, has, you know, it goes up to 200 degrees, and it just – You can cook yes. soup in it. Yeah, yes. you can, but I love it. I love it, and I think that's <laughs> vital to my office life. Yeah. That's fair. Office gadget. That yeah, that out. works. I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next one is not fair. It's like, I know. which child is your favorite? Which favorite hymn? Do you have a favorite hymn? 
Yes. My favorite hymn is What Wondrous Love Is This? Oh, I love that. Maybe a close second is Let's Go Down to the River to Pray. But these were songs sung frequently down south and just really kind of warm my heart. What wondrous love is this? Now, you talked about, you know, having to choose a favorite child or something. I'll tell you my least favorite hymn, hands down. I'll tell you that right now. It's it's Amazing Grace. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. Don't quit listening to Thy Strong Word because of this. But but Amazing Grace is, I just grew up with it. And you would sing it every single time you got in church. So I just, it's just over, overdone for me. But what wondrous love is this? Keeping it positive. That's my favorite. There we go. The Reverend Dr. Phil Boo, host of Thy Strong Word, pastor of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Pastor Boo, thank you so much for coming on for the initiation interview with us on the Concord. It's been fun. Thank you for the opportunity to be on Thy Strong Word, and I'll, I'll see everybody there on weekdays at 11 o'clock Central. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.